Welcome to the Office Hours Quality Payment Program. My name is Sylvia and I'll be operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. I will now turn the call over to Mona Matthews. Mona, you may begin. Thanks, Sylvia. Hello, everyone. This is Mona Matthews. I'm a project specialist with the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, serving Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. I would like to welcome everyone to this session of the QPT Office Hours. Today's call will be operator-assisted. By default, everyone's phones are currently muted to avoid background noises. Since this is an open office hours call, there will be opportunity to ask questions over the phone at which time our operator, Sylvia, will provide instructions. We will also be closely monitoring the chat box and encourage you to post questions or comments throughout. Also, please note that the information provided during this session is based on the latest information made available by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and is subject to change. CMS policies change, so we encourage you to review specific statutes and regulations that may apply to you for interpretations and updates. At the end of the office hours, you will have the opportunity to complete a brief evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback about this event and suggestions for future educational opportunities. We'd also like to remind those of you that received direct technical assistance related to the QPP to please take time to complete the evaluation sent at the conclusion of each technical assistance encounter. Your feedback is valuable and allows us to gauge how we are doing in regards to meeting your information needs in a timely and courteous manner. Also, I'd like to mention that during the office hours call, we typically can address a broad range of questions which are based on the equally broad range QPP MIPS knowledge level of our call participants. Some questions will be, will be able to be answered quickly. Others may require some additional time to research due to the complexity of the question, while others will be scenario specific to your organization. We, are, we have implemented a process to capture all the Q&A presented during these calls, questions that our team deems broad and applicable to all those in our audience will be emailed to the participants within two weeks of this event. Those that are scenario-specific, our team will address directly with the attendee via email or phone. Finally, questions that require more research or those that appear frequent, frequently will be addressed at the next office hours. I'll now turn this over to Reed to go over a few slides. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, introducing our webinar today in Office Hours, Mona. And did you want to hand over the ball, or I can have you advance the slides either? Just I, fine. I can. I thought you and had the slides, but I can. I can advance. Let's see if. Let's see if. Uh, did you see your slides change on your end there? Yeah, I did not. Okay. You just let me know when you need me to advance some read. I will. Sounds good. Well, why don't we um, forward in the, the slide deck here? And I know we had the disclaimer slide there. I think you covered that. So we'll start off mm -hmm. with a high-level overview of the QPT program final rule changes for year three. And that was released just about three, uh, two, a little over two weeks ago by CMS. And so we have some understanding and insights and a little bit of time to now, I've digested uh, a lot of this, but there are a lot of um, details in the thousand-plus pages, so there's a lot of holiday reading yet to do uh, to dive into the details. But I'll just go through a few of the bullet points here, and um, I think as Mona shared there, we'll have a lot of Q&A and time to ask about these things, and we'll try and answer them as best we can uh, today. So one of the changes is that CMS has expanded the clinician types and that now includes physician therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, clinical psychologists, and registered dietitians. 
and these aren't required. There's a possibility for them to opt in. And speaking of the opt in option, CMS has added a new threshold of 200 plus covered professional services. So if we kind of think back and what were the criteria for eligibility, it was $90,000 of Medicare Part B per year and having um, uh, 200 Medicare beneficiaries. So in addition to that, they brought in this uh, new 200 plus covered services as an opt-in option. So the, these new clinician types, if you wish them to participate, they can actually um, opt in and um, benefit from uh, including their score. They can either, again, participate individually or as a group. And you may kind of look at your strategy and say, you know, if these other uh, clinician types can help boost our group score if that's how we're doing reporting. Um, then you might kind of do a little analysis and determine um, which clinician types you have available to include in your group and how they will impact your score. And uh, so that's uh, some little food for thought there. There's another option for, for next year. There's also some changes to the uh, facility-based quality and cost uh, category changes. Um, so those that are working in point of service, um, 21, 22, 23, so hospital, um, ambulatory surgical centers um, and so forth can look at some uh, changes there. And Mona, was there anything in particular in your reading that was uh, impactful there or anything you'd want to share about that point? One, one thing that I would add to the facility-based quality and cost category, for those clinicians and groups that meet that 75%, as being um, hospital-based or one of the other categories, those facility quality that measures are automatically associated with those groups. So you don't have to do any reporting. And you can choose to report other quality measures, but if you don't, your score will be based on those facility-based quality measures. Very good. And then there additionally are some small practice bonus changes and how those determinations are made, um, you know, for adding to your score. There was a, a bonus uh, a number that was added if you're just in a small practice overall to the 100 per point overall performance score for all four categories. Now they're shifting that and saying we're going to give you a bonus and apply it to a single uh, category quality there. And Mona, yes. I believe that was uh, five points or was that six? It's on six one. points. It's six points, and it's a it's assigned to the quality category. So you do have to um, report in the quality category to achieve, achieve those um, bonus points, and they are subject to weighting of the category, I believe. Indeed, indeed. So that is a little bit changed for the overall performance score. So let's move on to the next slide. So scoring threshold and payment adjustment changes. So very small shift in the percentages that are assigned to the four categories. Really what happened here was cost was at 10% and quality was at 50 um, for the eight, uh, 2018 performance year. And that just shifted to 45 and 15, as you see on the screen, with promoting interoperability, formerly advancing care information, staying at 25 and improvement activities also remaining at uh, the current 15%. What we have um, seen in this final rule is a shift in the performance threshold moving up from 15 as sort of that minimum break-even neutral payment adjustment uh, score to 30 points. So they're making it a little bit more challenging. And then also shifting the exceptional care bonus threshold up just slightly from 70 to 75 points. So again, as a reminder, that exceptional care bonus is for those that are performing, of course, as you can see with the 75 threshold, a pin at the top. Um, you know, a level in the program and pulling from that $500 million pool that is then distributed based upon who achieves um, that threshold or greater. And uh, just a reminder, the payment adjustment does progress to be a little bit more concerning from 5% for the 2018 measurement period up to 7%, positive or negative, and then there's also a scaling factor. Um, based upon, you know, participation in the program and so forth. So that maximum minimum um, we know from the first year was plus or minus 4%, but the top performers actually came in just at a little over 2% um, as far as the payment adjustments go because 
We know that the program is budget neutral, and those who perform um, in the negative area are creating that pool of funds from which uh, the positive performers are being paid. So those are max mins. We may not hit those exact thresholds, but where you would hit that exact negative 7% threshold is for doing nothing. And then we'll also get to a slide here. Um, there's a, a little caveat about um, those that are performing in the lowest quartile below the, the minimum uh, threshold of 30 points. Let's jump to the next slide. So let's look at some of the specific category changes, and we'll start with quality up here at the top. So the claims data submission method is only available to small practices, so 15 and under. They're trying to restrict that and encourage people to go via a, a quality registry or QCDR or EHR reporting methods. Um, Performance-based scoring at the individual measure level um, is made available. And there's also, um, uh, that's also based on kind of a numerator denominator, yes, no, of submission method. Um, Mona, do you have any comments on the quality category beyond those bullet points or any clarifications there? I do not. I think you covered it. Okay, very good. Um, and costs, basically what happened there, and uh, I have some material in front of me that um, we don't have on the screen, but basically we had two cost measures um, that were determining what the score would be there, um, and that's the Medicare spending per beneficiary and then the hospital readmission um, measurement. Or I, I'm sorry, Mona, did I get that right? I didn't, I'm looking at two different things here. The, oh, the beneficiary per um, spending per the spending per yep. beneficiary, and then what else did you say? Yeah, the hospital readmission yep. was um, yeah. cost based. Okay, I was yeah. kind of oh, recited yeah, well, from just off the top of my head, <laughs> so we, just wanted to be sure to yeah. confirm that with you. Yeah, there is one other one, and I'm just I'll scroll to that, and we can we can update that in the um, sure. In the and so what they've done list. is sure. Yeah, CMS has added eight new cost measures, and those are episode-based cost measures, um, and there's some detail to that. So if you to kind of go through and itemize those, those would be routine cataract removal, screen surveillance uh, for colonoscopy, knee arthroplasty, um, and there's a number of others. And it's, you know, since there's a longer list, I won't read through them all, but that'll be in some of the detailed information that you'll probably look at when you look at the CMS summary of the changes there or want to learn a little bit more about that. One of the major changes, though, for 2019 is in the promoting interoperability category. They shifted away from this concept of having a base and performance set of uh, objectives and measures to really just having four um, kind of unified or simplified um, objectives that have uh, about six total uh, measurements to them. So, we end up with e-prescribing, health information exchange, provider to patient exchange, and public health and clinical data exchange. And one of the things that they've done is um, with e-prescribing, they've added a couple bonus items there, a five-point bonus if you do a query of a prescriptive, uh, prescription drug monitoring program, um, PDMP, and also verifying opioid treatment agreement. So there is some um, extra points available through that. With the health uh, information exchange objective, they have two measurements, and one is for uh, doing su uh, supportive electronic referral loops by sending health information, that's the outbound, and then the inbound is receiving and incorporating health information in each of those accounts for 20 points. The provider to patient exchange, exchange, or exchange is really the PHR, the patient portal, so providing patient electronic access to the healthcare information, and that's uh, really emphasized and underscored because it accounts for 40 points of the 100 possible there for the PI category. And then the public health and clinical data exchange is uh, the, the usual suspects of immunization registry reporting, electronic case reporting, public health registry, clinical data registry, and syndromic surveillance, and that accounts for 10 points there. One thing is that um, security risk analysis in the past has been uh, an objective. It's not really treated as such anymore. It's basically when you go in and report, you just need to state it's uh, kind of an attestation that you have done security risk analysis, and that one is really, uh, if you don't pass go, you don't get $200. So if you don't do that, as we know in years past, um, that is a core requirement, and you wouldn't be scored on the entire category. 
So improvement activities, um, that pretty much remains the same standard. There's a longer list of approximately 100 or so activities now, and six new ones were added, five activities were modified, and one was removed. Uh, one thing that I did get a question about was some concern about repeating improvement activities year over year, and I went to the CMS help desk and clarified this, and indeed, um, you can repeat all activities year over year with the exception of four, and we don't have them listed out here. And again, in this session, we're not going to detail everything here just from a, a time perspective, but if you're interested in knowing what those are, we can certainly get that information to you. Let's move on to the next slide. So back to what I had commented about with the change in scoring where we now have that maximum 75 uh, threshold above and beyond which that um, uh, exceptional bonus uh, amount would be paid out, and then the minimum threshold or neutral pain and adjustment at 30 points. And these charts here just kind of compare year over year, but I'm going to look really at uh, year three in the right-hand column there. What you see is that from zero to 7.5 points, the full negative adjustment of uh, minus 7% is applied. And that might be a little bit of a head scratcher, but it's actually in the macro law um, where it states what has to happen in the QPP MIPS program. And basically it states that the lowest quartile in any given year will be assigned that maximum uh, negative 7% uh, uh, adjustment or you know whatever that percent maximum is in any given performance year. So if you're 7.51, uh, or up to 29.99, then the negative payment adjustment is going to be somewhere between that maximum 7 and 0%. As I stated before, 30 is the, the neutral payment adjustment, and then anywhere uh, above that up to 75 points, then you'll get that kind of 0 to whatever the maximum is determined by how many or what that pool of funds is based upon those who are in the negative category and contributing to that pool of funds. So if you have any questions, we can certainly refer back to that. So kind of coming back again to key changes, I mentioned the category weights. We went over those, kind of this, the shifting of 5% moving from the quality to the cost category, so 45% and 15% respectively. We have those newly eligible clinician types that we went over. Um, the performance threshold increased. Um, uh, along with uh, the incentives and penalties with that percent adjustment, maximum of 7%, and then limiting the claim space measure, measures. Um, so that kind of, again, using that kind of carrot and stick method of encouraging people, unless you're in a small 15 and under organization, to doing that claim space type of reporting. And then also, going forward, uh, there is the requirement as of January 1st to have 2015 CERT technology in place and been using that. Um, in this year, in the first year of the program, we had the option of using 2014 certified EHR technology or 2015 or some combination of the two. Now it is just 2015. So if you're not certain or unsure what um, version of CERT you are on, certainly turn to your vendor and ask that question. And you also might want to ask about the, the timeline, um, you know, training, et cetera, around that, what kind of changes you might see with an upgrade to the 2015 cert if you're not already on that, but that certainly is required for the program. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention here, that the cost and quality uh, categories remain as a full year of reporting, and the improvement activities and promoting interoperability categories are 90 days. So because the promoting interoperability category is so focused on the use of cert, if you don't have that up immediately available, um, you know, you can look at doing your 90-day period a little bit later in the year if that doesn't sync up, sync up with the January 1st start date. Let's move to the next slide. So, again, um, kind of uh, a few uh, topics here. What's not changing, we still have the full year of performance. Um, reporting period, March 2020, so what is meant there is that just like uh, for 2018, we're going to have about a three-month window, January, February, and March, to do the reporting, and that will hold true um, for the 2019 uh, performance period. So we'll have that three-month window to do our reporting after the end of the year. Um, the payment adjustments for 2019, like subsequent years, are two years after the completion, completion of that calendar year. So uh, CMS receives the data, gets that reporting done in the first three months, 
and then they kind of crunch the numbers and then make the payment application at the beginning of the following year. Um, performance, again, this kind of restatement I just mentioned there, uh, 12 months, quality and cost, interoper promoting interoperability and improvement activities, 90 days, and the exceptions to participation in the program are those uh, clinicians that are newly enrolled in Medicare, um, those that may fall between that uh, below the low volume threshold. Uh, again, that was uh, 90,000 Medicare Part B or below uh, 200 Medicare beneficiaries. And we also have that new 200 uh, services within the calendar year. And then the other item is if uh, that clinician is significantly participating in an advanced alternative payment model and we would be considered a qualified participant or a QP. So I think that really kind of covers it. And, you know, we did step through it rather quickly. Um, Mona, I think I'll just hand it over to you unless you have some other points to add about the changes that we saw. I don't, I, and I don't really want to spend a lot of time on the physician fee schedule changes, but there were a few minor changes to the physician fee schedule. There were more more that were proposed. Some did not um, get confirmed when they released the final rule. But they are streamlining the documentation requirement for physician services, knowing the E&M codes, and kind of blending the payment. They do um, also, they've added quite a few non-face-to-face -face opportunities for billing for clinicians. This is really to reinforce the CMS patient over paperwork initiative that um, they want to reduce the administrative burden while improving care. So didn't really want that, this, um, the QPP rule was released as part of the of that physician fee schedule and if you need more information we can maybe address some of those in the Q and A as well as we can um, send you out some more information if if that's needed. Uh, so at this point we can open it up for questions. So Sylvia if you want to give the folks uh instructions on how to do that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touch tone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a delay before the first question is announced. If you have any speaker phone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touch tone phone. And the first question comes from Randy Terry. Yeah, this is Randy Thanks. Terry from Munson Healthcare. I um, submitted a couple questions in the box, but one of yep. them that I was taken off a little bit, or taken by surprise, was the four activities that we cannot use from the from the next year. Um, and I'm I'm assuming those are the improvement activities. Yeah, and that it, is correct. Uh, read you you have the list, but. I think for me, the way I, I don't remember the exact ones, but if you think kind of along the lines, things that are like a CMS uh, module that you do, you can't claim that as a, um, a an improved or not a not a CMS, but a module from from the CDC. You can't do that every year. Well, can Is that right, Reed? If you you have the list. Yeah, I don't have that right in front of me, but basically they were um, kind of training programs in nature, I believe, and we can certainly distribute that. But um, one of the things I found out, there was, uh, there was a little bit of misinformation out there, and that's the question. There was actually a, a vendor that had put in one of their webinars that you couldn't repeat any of the improvement activities year over year. And really, I think the, the um, kind of approach to that by CMS is that they want to encourage doing all those except the, the four that we can get to you um, year over year because you're working on some sort of trajectory to improving certain things. So why not continue to emphasize those activities year over year and allow um, reuse of, the, of, of most of all of the activities in that category? Well, if you could get those four to us or me. Absolutely, yeah. I'm interested. I would yeah, like to know that. that. I have another question. Yeah, we'll include that in what we send out. Go right ahead. Yeah, I can um, include that link 
or when we send out the Q&A, Randy? Great, perfect. Okay, and also, and cut me off when I'm taking too much time, but social workers, okay. they're not in anymore? That's correct. They were included in the proposed rule, Randy, but they did not make it when they um, did the final rule. Okay. And then another thing, on the CMS webinar uh, a couple days ago, they said there was a difference between facility-based providers and hospital-based, and they went on to explain the most confusing thing I've ever heard. So what in God's name is the difference between these two? I, I was not on that webinar, but the webinar that I was on, <laughs> yep, the webinar that I was on yesterday, um, they talked about looking at, you know, in the lookup tool, it will tell you whether or not the clinician is hospital based in the lookup tool and use that as your guidepost for hospital based. They don't use the terminology facility based in that lookup tool, to my knowledge. So what's the difference? That I don't you know, know. I have heard, I mean, I have heard these, and I appreciate your, your point that it was kind of confusing because I have heard them used interchangeably. In my understanding of it, it really kind of comes down to the point of service. And if you look at it from an analytical data perspective, that's how CMS makes a determination when you have those line item bills and they're looking at, well, where did that service occur? They're looking at the, the point of service that is, that is uh, submitted as part of that claim. And I understand that's 21, 22, and 23. Well, yeah, they went on to say hospital-based was 21, 20, whatever, 23, and facility-based had different numbers in there. And it's just like, what are you talking about? It seems to me that there was, I'm trying to find a note, but there were different um, POSs in facility and hospital-based. Oh, facility was 21 and 22. Hospital was 21, 23, and 19. And then they went on to say that there was a difference in the two, and it's just like, I couldn't, that's just, never heard of that. So if you could maybe well, look at Yeah, that. we'll definitely dig into that one and, and see if there really is a clear differentiation, as you had suggested you heard on that, that webinar, or if um, there is a more standardized universal definition that is a little bit more digestible. Yeah. All right. Because I, I, I have not that. heard that. Yeah, they, they said yeah. it, and I actually wrote it down, and so, yeah. Okay, the next thing is the cost, the cost category. There were two categories in 2018. And you said there are eight new categories. So are they all going to be judged equally? Let's say if they if they have numbers in category one and five and six, they would get, you know, three points toward the total, I don't know, 10%. Is that how they're going to work that? There's, it's not an easy answer on that. In, um, Randy, because it depends on whether or not you have the volume, the case volume for the cost measure itself. So there are right. eight new episode-based cost measures. So if you and don't have the volume, those would not be included? Those so would not be included, but then the others get, um, I mean, it gets put into to that, to the the other measures that you do include you in them. So if you if have, like, included. one, three, and five where you have the volume, that's what they're going to judge it on those eight that's episode in the two other ones. Is, is that, did that I is understand that right? Yeah, okay. that's correct. That's my understanding. Read, how about you, Any? I, I think that's pretty close, so I think we'll, we'll need to um, include that in our Q&A follow-up here to get a little bit more detail on, you know, providing information on those thresholds and then when is it included the number of cases and so forth. And like yes. Mona said, it really is dependent upon what type of practice, what type of services you're providing. Because you look at, if you look at the detail, um, these episode cost based, uh, episode based cost measures are really determined by those services. So I'm looking, I can read off a couple of them from the list here. One simple pneumonia and hospitalization, uh, intracranial hemorrhage or cerebral infarction. Um, obviously it's more neurological. In nature, and there's some uh, cardiovascular cost measures here, so um, it really would be dependent upon those services being provided. And clearly, for yeah. you know, family practice, general practice, um, they'll be more reliant on those two core ones that we have already been using. 
Okay. Yeah, and one other question, but I'll let everybody said, else go, and then you can come back. Yeah. <laughs> so the cost category, the case minimum is 10 for procedural episodes and 20 for acute inpatient medical conditions. Can you put that on a table and send that out to us? Absolutely. Actually, most of this information, just so that everybody um, is aware, and I can put it in the chat, is coming from the um, 2019 final rule fact sheet. And I will put the link to that in the chat right now. And I would add to that, Mona, that is a 29-page uh, overview, and they do have a nice table that really enumerates some of these changes that we just covered in bullet points and provides a little bit more detail and background. Right. Yep, it's a good it's a good tool. All right. So let's, uh, let's see if we have any other yeah, questions, and, and then we'll come back to, uh, to the uh, other folks if they have some. We have Cody online with a question. Okay. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. This is Cody from Oakland. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. Thank you for your time. This, this is very helpful. I um, had a question about the um, 2019 and beyond thresholds of 90,000 in Medicare claims or 200 patient volume. Does that apply even for the new services added like OT and PT? My understanding is yes, it does. So it's all services rendered for Medicare Part B. Yes, Medicare Part B. That was my interpretation of the new, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, and so, and yeah, and that 200, the, the service count is for each um, billable service under Medicare Part B that has a greater yeah. than a, that has a positive um, dollar amount billed to it. Okay. And I think the way CMS is looking at those is 200 line item service, you know, claims that would be submitted is what, and with the addition of that they are indeed a positive, not a zero cost or something. Okay. And part two of this would relate to the question that you were just talking to a few minutes ago was um, we have, like, for example, um, PT services provided under the hospital's building, but it is being performed by a specialist that builds under our tent. So I would think they would want to participate as long as they make the thresholds. They're going to have to participate in submitting data if they bill more than 90000 for Medicare. Well, they, they must participate if they meet all three thresholds, if, they're, if you're reporting individually. They must. Um, report. If you're reporting as a group, the group must meet all three of those to report. But there will be an opportunity to opt in, and there will be a mechanism to do that during the performance year. Um, CMS is still looking for some input on how they'll do that, so that we don't have that mechanism yet. But it, it will be... Um, a binding thing. Once you say I'm opting in, there won't be um, a way to revoke that. It'll be irrevocable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and a mind couple you minutes late. Um, what is the third threshold? We have the claims of ninety thousand. We have the two hundred uh, line items. What was the third threshold? It's two um, hundred thousand in um, in the approved charges, right? Well, actually, slight correction there. It's ninety thousand for the Medicare Part B oh, charges, and then yeah, and then two hundred. Yeah, I think you get those numbers. Medicare, <laughs> Medicare beneficiaries, and then the two hundred line items of uh, billed Medicare Part B claims. And the, the neat thing about the opt-in is that, um, including these new clinician types, that you only have to exceed one of those categories, and then you have the choice to include them or not. And as Mona said. If one of those clinician types were to exceed all three ca um, eligibility categories or thresholds, I should say, um, then they are required to participate. And then when you would go online and use the QPP NPI lookup tool, you'd see that determination has been made by CMS for that uh, clinician type. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Reed. No, no further questions at this time. Okay. So we um, did have a question in the chat about the 90,000 threshold. Does it still apply for 2019? And yes, it does. For, it is one of the low volume thresholds, as we just discussed, along with the other two, which is 200 patients. And that's 200 unique Medicare Part B patients and then the 200 line item services. Those are the three low volume thresholds. If a clinician meets those individually, they would be required to report to avoid a negative payment penalty. Yeah, and one thing I would comment, CMS in, in some of their comments and webinars that I've said in, they, they looked at adding that new threshold of 200 Medicare Part B services because they did have some folks that were, you know, below the 200 Medicare beneficiaries per year. They were taking care of some core, like um, patients with chronic conditions, but they were using many Medicare services or providing many services, so that enabled them to, to qualify or at least, you know, consider that opt-in option there. So that was the, the reasoning behind that. I know that um, we do have one other Lake Superior Quinn member on the call, Lisa Gall. If there's a way that we could get her onto the um, the panel group at all, that would be good because I know that she's got some input on that facility question that we received a little bit earlier. But we won't put you on the spot, Lisa. Well, this is a voluntary. <laughs> I know yeah. sometimes Lisa's uh, driving and so forth, so if you can't join us, no, no worries. Yeah. But if you can, that'd be great. Yeah. And let's see, we've got another question in the chat read. It says, the difference between hospital and individual, hospital and individual was during meaningful use, providers had different measures to report in a different pay structure than hospital-based providers? That's a comment that was made. And I, yeah. that I'm not, if you could comment maybe on that read at all. Yeah, I'm scrolling. I'm trying to, I was actually reading uh, one of the questions that I thought we were going to jump to was about nutrition profession. So I'm going to scroll oh. back and see if I can locate that yeah. and, um, address that one and I'm not quite And that one is in the chat. If you could put your questions in the chat, it's helpful. Um, then it, it's difficult to monitor both boxes. Gotcha. So let's um, let me come back to that one. Let's look at I know that okay. there was one in Q and A with the nutrition profession and okay. they were alongside the registered dietitian. And the, the question was, what do they mean exactly by nutrition profession? And I haven't seen a definition of what that actually is. Ramona, have you run into anything? I have not, but it's something that maybe we could research for for you. I don't know if, like, certified diabetic educators are in that group, but that I don't, I'm not sure. But we'll do a little bit of research sure. on that. We'll put it in yeah, the we'll pick that one offline. Okay, so now coming back to that meaningful use question, now I kind of understand what, what they're asking. So there was um, uh, two parts to the meaningful use program, and that was um, for the meaningful use hospital program, which continues on, and that has now been renamed Promoting Interoperability. And then they had um, kind of the ambulatory side um, with uh, eligible professionals. Um, so we kind of basically took a fork in the road here and for ambulatory providers, Medicare Part D, that is the MIPS program. The Meaningful Use program has evolved, again, renamed to promoting interoperability, and that continues on for hospitals and also for Medicaid um, hospitals and Medicaid ambulatory providers. That's all called promoting interoperability, whereas promoting interoperability is one unique of, uh, category within, you know, the four available categories within uh, uh, the MIPS program. So that might be where the confusion comes, but they are really kind of unique and separate programs. The the reason they use that common label was the CMS policy under SEMA Verma to emphasize uh, health information exchange and sharing of data and information, 
and it uh, unfortunately has led to some confusion. So I hope that addresses that question. And if it doesn't, if you can get in the queue, maybe, and ask a, another question or put it in the chat, that yeah, would be helpful. Yeah, or follow-up question would be just fine. Yeah. So the next question, read in the um, chat that I have is a difference, let's see here, for 2018 performance year, you had to choose an outcome measure or high priority measure only if an outcome measure is not available or applicable for your practice. Is that the same for 2019? And Okay, and I'm re rereading that. And so I think says, there's a negative that was dropped in there because it says only if an outcome measure is not. It was only if an outcome measure is available, I think, might have been the more appropriate phrasing there, and then you would have to to choose that if for some reason for your specialty practice that a high priority um, or outcome measure was not available, then you weren't required to do that. Is that your understanding, Mona? That's my understanding. And same thing when you're using specialty measure sets, if there are not six measures within a specialty measure set, you should report the entire measure set. And you don't need to report more. It will cause your denominator to change Let's say there's only four in your specialty measure set, your denominator would change to 40 instead of 60. In the yeah, if you have questions case. around the specialty measure sets and so forth, you can always lean on CMS. They have a, a health desk number where you can call up and just con confirm and verify if you like. Um, one of the confirmational things is when you go on the qppcms.gov website and you go to the quality measures and there's an explore measure section, you can actually sort by those various specialties and identify, you know, what those measures are. And then if you have any question that there should be other um, measures that you should report on or, um, you know, if you think you have just that more restricted set like Mona's example of four instead of six, um, it certainly is worth following up on rather than waiting till later in the reporting year. Right. Okay. And let's see. Okay. Pardon me, Mona. We do have Lisa online with a question. All right. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Well, I was talking to myself a few times, but I'm sorry. I didn't get jumped on as a speaker. Um, just on that clarification for the facility base, and hospital-based, you know, I, I don't know if you can see my comments there. And, um, I but did the facility, see them. I, yeah. yeah. So facility-based is only for those who want to report with their facility as a facility. That's where they take that into account. And the hospital-based are those who work in those point of services, um, and would be eligible, you know, at least 75% of the time, and then would be eligible for, at least this year, for special scoring and or for um, opting out of improvement, uh, not improvement activities, promoting interoperability if they're hospital-based. So that's the difference. So Facility-based is only for those who want to report with their um, organizations facility reporting. And so Lisa, they, we're talking there then about the promoting interoperability program rather than the MIPS program. So they're kind of jumping over the fence there. Um, not really. Because in 2019, you have that option to do facility-based reporting instead of doing an individual or group. And, and Lisa, okay. I was yeah. on a uh, a CMS call yesterday where they mentioned that if you are included in the facility-based reporting, they will automatically pull the, the um, facility-based measures into your MIP score. Now, if you also report MIPs in the quality measures, they'll look at both of those and wherever you score higher is that you're going to, is where you're going to get your quality score. Right, and that's, and facility reporting is only for, I believe it's only for quality scoring, um, or are they taking the They were also, I think, going, 
I no, it wasn't improvement activities, but I thought there I was a cost that. element, a cost element to it. Yeah, cost and quality are the only two that yeah. will be counted for you if you report only in a facility based reporting. So if you do want to um, also report your improvement activities and um, PI, then you should do that separately, and they will add those two scores. That's correct. So that was my point, I think, um, just basically to clarify what facility-based means. It's for those who are reporting with a facility. Where hospital-based is looking at more of how much time do you spend in the hospital and what kind of service, and do you then qualify for um, an exclusion from promoting interoperability, and in some cases, special scoring. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sylvia, can you remind callers on how to get into the queue? In the chat, I have somebody asking. Yeah, once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one, on your touch tone phone. And we have Randy in line with a question. Um, I, I just uh, was asking about the HIE measure, the second measure. It's, um, you know, receiving the CCDs and and incorporating is that incorporating the same as reconcile meds, problems, list, and allergy, or is it incorporating the CCD into the medical records? You know, I'll address that one. I had a call with the CMS help desk and got escalated up to level two, and I've yet to get a, a straightforward answer on the incorporating requirement. Uh, I did have insight into one vendor where they had designed the system so when they received the CCD, they would parse out each of the fields within the CCD, and then the clinician could go through and say, these are the elements I want the meds, med allergies, problem with, et cetera, but leave everything else off and incorporate that into the chart. So one vendor had approached it that way. It could be that others are approaching that and saying, we'll digest that as a PDF so they're not parsing it out and putting it into discrete fields as a chart. But with that regard, I wanted to confirm what they were required to do, the vendors are required to do uh, as, far as, as part of the 2015 certification, what does their system need to be able to accomplish in order to consider that information incorporated? So trying to get some definition around that. So I wish I had more for you at this time, but trying to find out a little bit more, uh, again, kind of the, new, the newness of some of this. Well, when you find out, will you let us know? We'll definitely get that plugged into our office hours, and if I find out um, before our uh, two-week deadline for answering all these goes out, we'll we'll bring it up in the next uh, office hours Thank uh, call. Mm -hmm. Mona, or Lisa, do you have any insights on that, or had you run into this uh, incorporating issue? Only what you've shared, um, Reed. Okay. And we do have Michelle online with a question. I just have a question regarding the uh, requirements that um, you need to meet in order to, re to have to report for 2019. Um, if you meet two out of the three requirements, are you required to report, or is that an optional? That will be an optional. Okay. Thank you. You would have to meet all three in order to be required to report. Now, for the opt-in, there will be an opt-in process that will happen during the performance year, and once you opt-in, it's irrevocable, so then you would have to report. Okay. So if you meet two out of the three, you can opt-in, but once you opt-in, you are required then to report. That's correct. Then you become a required reporter. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. No further audio questions. You do have one other question here, and I'm not exactly sure what they're asking, but I'll I'll read it. Um, it's can you please explain what the changes for clinical social workers refers to, and I. Oh, I think, yeah, I think I know what this is. Originally in the proposed rule, social workers were listed as a possibility of becoming eligible clinicians. 
they were not included when the final rule came out. I think that's what this is referring to. I would agree, Mona. I think they just wanted a little clarification on the earlier point. Okay. I do not see it. Let me so check in, the yeah, Q&A. Uh, while we're waiting here, I might, yeah, uh, why don't you, while you're checking that, Mona, I just wanted to mention a couple other things, um, since there's so many other little details that might be interesting to know that um, in the current year, there's a bonus for using uh, 2015 CERT uh, as part of your one of your improvement activities, if it's listed as such, that would apply to the, pro, uh, perform, I'm sorry, promoting interoperability category, and that is going away next year because everybody's required to use 2015 CERT, so there's no incentive um, there. Okay. The other thing I might add is, um, you know, I, I mentioned before that we don't have this concept anymore for the promoting interoperability category of having a base score, which was 50 points, and then a performance of another 50 points, it kind of reverts back to, for anybody that was used to participating in meaningful use, that um, you kind of had to do kind of this fixed set of measures, and while it's not it's not really an all or none, um, you're kind of accumulating based upon recording a, a little bit more streamlined set, and in my mind, it just kind of seemed a little bit similar to the previous meaningful use program, where it's just a simple list of objectives and measures, and you kind of performed on those, and um, in this case, you know, we have certain points allotted, uh, just like in the past year for MIPS for each of those measures, but uh, they certainly are kind of shifting over to the policy of, of emphasizing health information exchange and electronic access and really dropped all others that were really not focused on that, that policy emphasis. Thanks, Reed. We are at about five minutes, too. So we do have time for one more question, if anybody has a question. I would also share with everyone that next month's office hours, um, I don't have, not sure the date, is it the 13th of December? Um, but we will post that on our, um, and get every, get everybody an invite of that too. And at future office hours, we, on the 13th of December, we'll, um, feature getting ready for reporting for the 2018 performance year. In January, we'll do a little deeper dive into the PI category for 2019. In February, we're going to look at the quality category a little bit more deeply. And in March, we'll talk a little bit about reporting for 2018 and improvement activities. And then in April, we'll review the cost category in a little bit more detail. If there are no other questions, and I check with Sylvia before I you know, conclude the call. Sylvia, do we have anybody else in the you for call. No audio questions. No questions. Okay. All right. Reed, did you have anything else to add for today? The only thing I would add is to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and thanks for your time today. And indeed, like Mona said, the 13th of December is our next call. So look forward to talking with you again. And uh, we'll add those clarifications and do some research and get uh, some answers out to you. And I would thank everyone again for joining us today. As mentioned on the outset, we'll compile the and vet the questions posed today and email you the answers. Um, contact you directly or present, um, present responses in more detail at our next office hours. And at the conclusion of this webinar, you will be asked to provide some feedback if you wouldn't um, mind taking just a few minutes and filling out that survey. We'd really appreciate it and your 
feedback's very much appreciated, and a thanks again for joining us today. This concludes the call. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for